the acute environmental releasers. Aggression as our fixed action pattern, what are some of the releasing stimuli for aggression? Some of the most reliable ones are ones that always, always demand you to interview an animal in its own language across different species, just as with sexual behavior releasing stimuli. Some species become aggressive in response to smells, to sounds, to sights, to you know, our whole array with this. Here's one version. Here's a species of ant that gets aggressive in response to vibration. And these are ants living in East Africa that have a symbiotic relationship with trees there, acacia trees. And what happens is the acacia trees grow these little sort of igloo, bubbly, spheroid things on their branches, which have holes in them, and which provide perfect living environments for the ants. So acacia trees are giving ants a home, and what the ants do in return is they protect the acacia tree from herbivores. Herbivores eating their leaves. What happens? Along comes a giraffe and begins to chew, and it breaks a branch, and the vibration causes all of these ants to come pouring out and bite the giraffe's lips at which point the giraffe goes to a different tree. So we see in that case, what's the releasing stimulus? Go and shake a branch and you suddenly have 4,000 ants angry at you. All these deals again and again, interviewing an animal in its own language. So what are some of the reliable releasing stimuli in humans? Same theme as with the sexual behavior. We don't have any auditory stimuli that automatically trigger aggression. We don't have any olfactory ones. We don't have any, we've got some subliminal ones. Remember that study mentioned a few weeks back, take sweat from someone who is frightened as opposed to the same amount of sweat from someone who's been happily exercising. That was that deal of swabbing the armpits of people jumping out of airplanes. Take sweat from someone who is frightened and subliminal exposure to it, the amygdala activates. So we're not completely free of sensory stuff, but we're not triggered in any sort of way that's as dramatic as in other species. So what sort of sensory, multi-sensory, multimodal sort of things trigger aggression? Number one most reliable one is pain. Make an organism feel pained and you have greatly increased its likelihood of turning around and biting the closest thing to it. So pain as a trigger for it. Frustration as a trigger. Take a rat, train it to press a lever. Ten times it gets its food. Ten times it gets its food. Ten times it doesn't get its food. Ten times you're not giving it its food. Get the rat good and frustrated and with great reliability if there's another rat sitting there it's going to spin around and bite it. So displacement aggression being driven there by frustration, by pain, things of that sort. And what's really depressing is if you are a rat or a primate and you are sitting there being frustrated by not getting a reward and your glucocorticoid levels have risen, go and bite somebody else and your glucocorticoid levels will go down. And there we describe a very depressing feature about our social world. Displacing aggression on somebody else in species after species is stress reducing. So triggers, triggers for that. Great example of this and a remarkable one. Back to that business from a couple of weeks ago, that alternative mating strategy of orangutan males. That business after hearing all that heartwarming alternative strategy stuff of male baboons forming friendships with females. Meanwhile, the alternative strategy with orangutan males being something that absolutely fits all the definitions of rape. Well, do you see anything like that in some other primate species? And you see it every now and then among male baboons. Again, defined as forced sex with a female who actively attempts to get away and actively attempts to resist. What you see under that sort of definition is every now and then it will happen in baboons. What is the circumstance? I've seen it three times over the years. Other people have seen it occasionally as well. It's always the exact same circumstance. It is the number one male on the day or the day after that he has just been dumped out of his alpha position. And most of the time, the animal goes and mopes somewhere else. Most of the time, the animal mopes and then finds somebody smaller to beat up on. The only times I've seen this over all these years, that was exactly the circumstance. Frustration, aggression, displacement, very, very familiar. 
When we get to some more environmental factors, later on some of the big ones, what we will deal with in this context is the relationship between why is it that when the economy gets bad, violence goes up? Why does poverty breed violence? And this is consistently the case. Why is that occurring? Some framing theoretically within the context of frustration and pain and stress are really reliable predictors of aggressive behavior. But again, it's the same theme as with alcohol. Pain makes organisms that are already predisposed towards being aggressive more aggressive. It does not do so uniformly across the board. Frustration, the same exact thing. Once again, we have something modulating, amplifying, blunting, damping, all this sort of theme again and again, some other factor there. Another example of this, another environmental trigger, and study the subject somewhere in the 1950s or so, and the top thing that you would get on the list in terms of environmental releasers for aggression would be overcrowding. And this was a whole literature that emerged at the time. A psychologist named Calhoun, John Calhoun, started this whole field. And what he would do was take a bunch of rats living in uh, enclosure of a certain size and go about observing them and they're going about their rat business and now put all of them into a much smaller space, a higher density, crowd them. And what he reported was aggression explodes at that point. Aggression goes through the roof, crowding causing aggression. The two factoids, or rather the one factoid that everybody learned from that literature for decades afterward from the Scientific American papers was violence would go up to the point that rats would start killing and cannibalizing each other. Urban crowding making our next generation of cannibals, which is exactly what an awful lot of sociologists were off running with, not to mention various southern senators who talked about the menace of inner city population density and spawning violence because overcrowding causes aggression. Whole literature, and it took a number of years until people started looking a little bit closer at the animals. And on the average, the rate of aggression does not change with crowding. You could probably fill in the next sentence by now. What you see instead is animals that are already aggressive become more aggressive when you crowd them. Animals that are subordinate and unaggressive become even more weak and withdrawn. What these early generations of studies were doing wrong was folks sitting there just looking for the exciting stuff. Oh my God, we just saw a rat cannibalize another one. I sure never saw that with a big enclosure. The actual quantitative rates of aggression do not go up with crowding. Aggressive individuals become more aggressive then. And we readily can fit that into scenarios of frustration, displacement, that kind of thing.